Very happy to be here and, and welcome you to North Georgia. If you didn't realize it, you're only about one hour from the what's considered the birthplace of the integrated poultry industry in Gainesville. Uh, if Georgia were a country, we would be the fifth largest producer of chicken meat in the world. So there's a lot of broiler chickens here in Georgia. And uh, we spend a lot of time, my students and I do, on farms and, and working with the industry. So uh, as a, a veterinarian, when, uh, you know, I've just kind of gotten my head around judicious use, and now we're talking about stewardship. I didn't really understand what the, uh, the definition of stewardship is. So I had to look it up in the dictionary, and, and uh, that's obligations, duties of a steward. Well, a steward is someone who works on a boat and, and gives you the, the food and the, the, takes care of the money. So I think what we're talking about is someone who's directing the affairs of antibiotic usage. And in my opinion, that, that is primarily the veterinarian. I have a colleague, John Smith, who uh, is a veterinarian with a small broiler company here in North Georgia, in uh, Baldwin, Georgia. They process about 2.5 million broilers a week. And he's helped me with some of the facts and figures I'm going to share with you. For poultry, we have, a, um, and I'll, we'll talk more about it, we have primarily these four drivers and cost because of the large volume of, of broilers that a company produces, small changes in cost can have a significant impact on your bottom line. So yes, cost comes into the equation when we're talking about uh, using antibiotics in, in uh, poultry production, both chickens and turkeys. Uh, the consumers. Uh, are not really who's driving it for poultry. It's the customers of the, the chicken and turkey companies. It's the, the large retailers. And I've spent um, several days these last few months <clears throat> visiting, and I'll be visiting with some other the large retailers and restaurant chains about antibiotic-free and antibiotic usage in poultry. They're driving a lot of this discussion on antibiotic-free, or ABF, as, it, as it's been termed in, in the poultry industry. And of course, the governmental regulations, the, you know, the CDC, the FDA, are also uh, significant drivers in how the poultry industry um, is utilizing antibiotics in our export markets. Between 18 20 percent of the production of the eight and a half billion broilers produced in the United States are exported. So export customers are also driving. To help you better understand those of you who aren't familiar with poultry, um, there's really two groups of, of people that are involved in um, the production of uh, broiler chicken uh, or broiler and turkey meat. The primary breeding companies, and there's, there's really only um, three broiler and, and one turkey primary breeding company in the United States. So you're talking about f four companies, and I would say less than a dozen veterinarians responsible for all of that um, breeding stock for the entire U.S. And then the integrated poultry companies, and again, in broilers, five companies would probably, I'm just going to guess, be at least 60% of the production. So if you look at all the broiler and turkey veterinarians in the United States and the layer veterinarians, you're, you're probably talking about 100 or less veterinarians responsible for all of that production. So the integrated poultry industry has fairly tight controls over what is administered either in the feed or the water. The farmer that owns this farm and who's caring for these birds is not going to be able to, to just go to the local feed store, buy some antibiotics, or to ask a veterinarian to write a prescription for an antibiotic and use them. 
they cannot use or do anything without approval of the company that they're growing those birds for. And virtually all of the companies either have a veterinarian on staff or have a consulting veterinarian that they work with. So the the controls are fairly tight when it comes to antibiotic use in, in poultry. This graph is, is dated, but what I want you to look at is the trend. When I'm, as a poultry veterinarian, when I'm teaching my students, I'm teaching them that if you have to treat a flock of chickens or a flock of turkeys for a disease, a bacterial disease with an antibiotic, you failed. You're a failure. Your job is to prevent disease. And the poultry industry has worked very hard to reduce um, disease incidents for a lot of those reasons we talked about as the drivers, even before some of the governmental regulations came in place. As you can see, the, the amount of field condemnations, the amount of, of birds that are condemned by USDA has significantly dropped. And I would say in broilers today, that number's probably down at 0.6 or below. So bird health has significantly improved. This is the, the livability, the number of birds that are taken to market. So uh, today it's probably closer to 98% of the broilers make it to market, 2% mortality on eight and a half billion birds. So the health is significantly improved and it's not because of antimicrobial usage, it's because of disease prevention. And based on, on a lot of uh, improvement in the environment and the husbandry. So prevention of disease is a significant portion of the, the stewardship program that the poultry industry utilizes. These are the, the, there's two pictures at the top um, are intestines that are diseased by necrotic enteritis. The one on your left would be clinical necrotic enteritis and the one on, on your right would be subclinical. And the one on your right is what the growth promoting antibiotics have been used for for the last 40, 50 years to prevent that. The birds don't die, they just don't convert food into into muscle very well. Air sacculitis or respiratory disease <clears throat> is is this major is one of the major reasons that we will use therapeutic antibiotics in poultry. That pericarditis, perihepatitis you see in the bottom. But the the intestine on, on your left, that necrotic enteritis will also the clinical form of it will also result in, in treatment. For poultry veterinarians, the debate has been around the growth promoting antibiotics as it has been with everyone else. And, and there's not a whole lot of, of uh, arguments over the, um, the, the usage of them. We know why we use them. The labels are, are where the argument comes in. You know, the, the streptogrammins, the, the um, glycopeptides, uh, glycopeptides, uh, avoparsin was never approved in the U.S. But the ones that we get a lot of criticism for, but we have, in my 30-some years of, uh, of a, being a poultry veterinarian, have never used as growth promotants, even though there is a label for that, are oxytetracycline, the tetracyclines and penicillin. Those have not been used, even though there's a label where they could be used as growth promotant, because those are our primary therapeutic drugs for that respiratory disease and those enteric diseases. In 2012, I was asked to give a, um, a summary of what the health situation was in the southeastern United States. So I surveyed the veterinarians responsible for all the, the broilers in that region. So you can see I surveyed 17 veterinarians for the major portion of the broiler production in the U.S. And they ranked coccidiosis, so a protozoan, necrotic enteritis, a clostridial disease, respiratory disease. So 
as I said, the, those are what we will need to treat birds for. In the past, we've used the growth promotants as um, sub-therapeutic prevention of necrotic enteritis. But, you know, that if, if the labels change and, and if companies continue to use some of the, the drugs that have been used as growth promotants and use them as preventative for necrotic enteritis, then that will continue. The cephalosporin ceftiofur is no longer used in poultry. It's no longer used in, in broilers because of the, the requirement of no longer can you use it extra labelly? All broilers are injected in the egg for um, a virus that causes tumors called Merrick's disease. And so an antibiotic was added with that, um, that vaccine. And Ceftiofur at one time was one of those. And it's no longer because it, it was only labeled for day old injection. There is reduced, but not completely, has genomycin use stopped. Um, so genomycin is, is, is sometimes used by broiler companies to inject in ovo. And that is to help, um, you know, a, ba a baby chick's uh, immune system doesn't become fully competent until they're about two to three weeks of age. So it's there as an aid during that period of time. There is less antibiotic growth promotants used today. I can't tell you how much less. I don't know that anyone has that figure, but I can tell you there are some fairly large companies producing a lot of chickens today and turkeys that don't use any antibiotics at all. And so that, has, that is market-driven, not regulatory, but market-driven to, to reduce antimicrobial use in that instance. And there are a lot of companies that have already begun the process that they're going to have to kind of road test the process of what it's going to be like in December 2016 when guidance document 209-213 kick in on writing prescriptions and writing VFDs. So that's already begun. I want to talk to you just a little bit about some of the things that the poultry industry has agreed voluntarily to do um, at, in what I believe is, is being a good steward uh, for antimicrobial usage. So we're all aware of NARMS and, and how the NARMS program began in humans. Uh, we know the, the NARMS on the, the market basket buying product in the stores that FDA does, um, CDC's part with the human. USDA has done the, uh, has had the, the NARMS looking at um, Salmonella and Campylobacter on poultry out of the processing plants. But four or five years ago, they were realizing that the number of Salmonella and Campies were significantly dropping coming out of processing plants, and so they were not getting a very good representative sample. And they came to Randy Singer and I and said, do you think you could pilot a program where we take samples on farms and look at the antimicrobial resistance uh, levels of Salmonella and Campylobacter off of the farm. Well, we said that we, we will try, but it's going to require cooperation by the poultry industry, and will they voluntarily provide that, in, provide, give us opportunity to, to get those samples. And the industry agreed, um, and we began the program. The money comes from FDA, goes through USDA, through a CRADA, and that's the only way that the industry will agree, and that was the only way we would do it, is, is that it would be blinded. The CRADA prevents um, anyone from asking for information of, about what where did these samples come from? Where did these results come from? And then they're coded and, and run through the university's diagnostic lab. 
our goal was to try to get at least 60 percent of the industry to, to participate, and we were very successful at that. Uh, and we also wanted to collect the antibiotic usage that was on those farms that we were collecting those samples. And, you know, Randy and Roy Burgess being epidemiologists, they have all these formulas and, and uh, percentages and things that they're figuring out. But the bottom line to me is the number of samples. It would take 1,500 samples from 360 farms, 46 complexes, to be representative of the United States. And we accomplished that <clears throat> by taking eight farms a week, Fort Boot Sox a farm, and then also sending the, out the survey, which was completed by the production people that took those samples on that, those farms. So all of that runs, flows down through and <clears throat> where we currently are is presenting the results to the poultry industry. I'm going to give you a little brief glimpse of, of what the results were from last year's. But that, that information right now is those companies that cooperated, if they would like to know their particular results, we can decode down to the complex so that they can see for themselves. But so far as what FDA gets, so far as what you get, anyone will get, is just the big picture. Not anything down to, is it the southeast, the midwest, the west, just the big picture. Keep in mind that for, for Randy and I, this data is only valuable as a trend. What this year's is, what last year's is, what the year before was, individually is worthless. It's what the trend is. So the antibiotic use survey looks like this, asking the farm name, where, where the, what uh, anticoccidials, what antibiotics, did you have any diseases that you had to use treatment. And last year we we got 258 broiler farms, and we found some salmonellas, we found some campies on both broilers and turkeys. And I know you can't read this, and by purpose, I haven't blown it up so you could read it, because we haven't shared it with all of the cooperating companies yet. <laughs> this is what FDA calls is a squash -a gram <clears throat> Don't ask me why it's called a squash -a gram you have to ask somebody at FDA. But what they do is they pile everything, and this is the way that, that CVM looks at the results, is in, in the, this format. What may be easily read is anything to the right of that red line is the percent resistance. Everything to the left is sensitive. So you can see that the data is there, the industry is cooperating, and the industry wants to understand what amount of antimicrobial resistance we have in those foodborne pathogens that could potentially transmit it to humans. So in Salmonella, we've got, you know, even all of the, the NARMS panel on the sense titer test of antibiotics. You know, one concern is the quinolones. No resistance on the quinolones. Campies. And this is both Campy coli and Campy jejuni. Jejuni is the primary one. Quinolone resistance, you know, 16 percent of the jejuni is a resistance, 25 percent of the coli's. Fluoroquinolones have been gone now for, what, 10, 15 years. So, you know, there is a lot of intrinsic resistance present for some of these bacteria that, you know, that's a whole other day of discussions. On the survey, remember, this is the antibiotic usage on those farms that the, the antimicrobial resistance was determined on the salmonellas and campies. It's not useful for the whole industry, it's just those farms. 
But you can see there is some use of the ionophores uh, for anti-coccidial. Uh, there is growth promoter use in broilers. And there is some therapeutic usage on the farms that we tested. In turkeys, a similar picture, maybe a little more therapeutic usage, but keep in mind broilers live to 48 days on average for the study. Turkeys, you're up to 88 days. They're going to live a longer period of time and be exposed to more things. Plus, as Eric Gonder and I know, turkeys are hatched looking for a way to die. So they tend to need to be treated a little more often. We, so if you ask, is the poultry industry being good stewards of antimicrobials, I'd say yes, because they want to understand. They've, they ha we've had very minimal pushback on this. They want to understand, you know, what is the risk? What is the effect of our usage on those uh, two, two potential major sources of antimicrobial resistance transfer with Salmonella and Campy to people? So we've had very good compliance by the broiler and turkey industry. And they've, they've very willingly um, participated and are, are continuing to willingly participate. The second step, and uh, I just saw Dr. Appley walk back in and sit down, is to utilize uh, a survey that Randy and uh, Mike published um, with uh, the uh, looking at swine and trying to understand the antimicrobial use volume um, by estimating volume um, of usage because that's the next major question that we've got to face is, you know, we, we get this, well, 80% of the antimicrobial usage is uh, in the U.S. is in food animals. Well, yeah, a lot of it is the ionophores, which there is no human equivalent, but there's still no real good answer to that. So U.S. Poultry Association has agreed to fund us to do a pilot survey of the entire poultry industry to, to better understand antimicrobial use metrics so we can know how much is used as growth promotants, how much is used as therapeutic, how much is, of it is the ionophores, how much goes in the water, how much goes in the feed. Um, utilizing the same um, method or methodology uh, as best we can that that uh, Dr. Apley used and, and the group used for this paper. And so for me, I try to emphasize as I talk with the poultry industry, we don't want to go down this road. We don't want to, to, to keep pushing back and allow um, those folks who don't understand what we're doing and understand that there is a significant reduction in the amount of antimicrobial use without any regulatory action. Um, we don't need the, the representative slaughters of the world trying to put some laws in place that, that will put us in a corner like our European Union counterparts have been put into, um, which resulted in a greater uh, animal health issues and drove their food animal production out of the out of their country so that they're importing a significant portion of their food so that's why the I think the poultry industry has volunteered to do many of the things that that they have and I think the rest of of food animal production is, is also going down that route um, integration makes it much easier forced to put programs in place. And the, the preventive health programs, the antimicrobial usage programs. So for poultry, it, it is a, an easier thing to do. Um, the market is driving a significant number of, of broiler and turkeys to be produced without antibiotics anyhow. So the, the, the 
customers and the consumers are driving it in that direction anyway. Um, so we, we don't really need the regulations. And to me, that's a much better way to, for us to do it. Antimicrobial stewardship is, is let the market decide. The on-farm participation, the on-farm norms participation has been excellent by the poultry industry. And I think um, I will be very surprised if we have much pushback in December when we roll out the, um, the survey so that we can begin to understand the actual volume of usage for the different indications for the different antimicrobials in poultry. Thank you.